looks like we are live paul for another thursday truth proof live stream welcome thank you les and uh, yeah we're live again only just but we're alive so mm -hmm. that's always yeah. a good thing isn't it and uh, what kind of week you had ah uh, busy busy been doing projects and uh Obviously, I've got projects outside of uh, Truth Proof as well to deal with. So, yeah, all good. Yeah, well, I think everybody has, aren't they? You know, but it, it, this is, uh, it consumes a big part of our lives and a, a, a big part of our guests' life as well. It was uh, probably a lot of people waiting to speak, to, uh, waiting to hear what he's got to say because he's an interesting guy. Really looking forward to speaking with him. But, uh, first, let's just have a look in this chat. Yeah, we'll do a little bit. I don't know how many people are in, so I'm. Apologies if I'm, if I miss your name because I've just got a short list here. But there's Dragonborn, James Coppet. Good to see you, James. Steve Teased, Rod, Mark. Uh, what have we got? Simon Riley, Linny's in. Jay Austin. Good to see you, Jay and Martin Abbas. Uh, I'm not saying good to see you in any particular order, by the way, people. Uh, OGG, Steph, David Bancroft. I think Kim will be in. Vlad. Uh, Ralph Winter and Elaine's in, and I'm gonna miss out Enigma. So, yeah, Mark Anderson, Ben 22, Ross Gilbert, Carol, Karen Behrman, Joanne. It's brilliant having all this support. And uh, remember tonight, because we've got a guest who I don't say it lightly can talk for England about the subject on just about every level of the subject. So, let's have some amazing questions for him. All unexplained related, please put them in capitals, send them to moderator and she'll uh, she'll make sure that they get read out. And I don't care if it's question driven this because uh, he, he's catch, Steve Mira rises to the occasion when it comes to uh, being asked questions about the, the unexplained. So there you go. Yeah. And as, King, and as yeah, said, nice uh, right. yeah. Ralph Blueshift. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to stop because I know you want to start this. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, thanks, Jessica, for doing the moderating tonight. And uh, as you say, Paul, she will be sending the questions through to me. And uh, yeah, looking through the, all everybody in the chat, great support. Gordon Carrick, yes. Mark Sue. Yeah, you feel guilty when I see a name and I've not said it. Rebecca King, you know. So, <laughs> Jay Austin, welcome Jay to the show. Yeah, and uh, yeah, all good to go. So, on the count of three, two, one, we will bring Mr. Steve Mir on. Brilliant. Hi, Steve. Hi, hi. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. Honestly, I, I know every time you come on or when Barry's been on, it's easy. But you know, because your knowledge, you can just ask a question and just let it roll, and uh, or your views on something. So, uh, for anybody that doesn't know, anybody that's been living under a stone and who went involved in unexplained, Steve Mira. Writer, researcher, international lecturer of all things unexplained. I think, you, I mean, brilliant reputation around the world for the things that you look into and do, Steve. So welcome, Steve, and uh, tell us what you've been up to. Uh, well, I mean, we're doing some research. I mean, we're continuing Project Doorway, and, you know, and it's just surprising, you know, some time ago um, I was asked to go on a call, um, a bit like a podcast, but not really streamed out in the sense of speaking, but uh, the gentleman in question, which I can't name, um, had another computer set up next to him, and he's obviously looking at another computer, and he was linked up on this other computer with other people. And he um, he said, these, these other people, he referred to them as the Advanced Working Group. I've heard of these guys before. These are ex-operatives um, from the US government, um, in a hierarchy sort of thing in regarding project research and stuff related to the subject. And um, they wanted to ask me some questions. I was a bit so kind of put on the spot, really, because I wasn't really expecting it. Um, and it was just a series of questions that were really unusual. The first question, believe it or not, was, have you ever worked for MI5? I said, uh, no. I said, what about the Department of Defence or anything? I said, no. I said, I'm in the UK. I said, not working for the ministry. Well, actually, I did actually do a little bit, a little spent for them, but not not in any sort of official capacity uh, for the country. So it's just a strange questions. And he, he asked me about some of the research that Project Door is involved. So I told spe very specific questions, interestingly. So, so they'd already done their homework. Well, yeah. I mean, from what I gathered, 
they knew what we were doing. And um, when I mentioned a few things, they said, uh, there was one question came through and it said, um, where did I get that information from? Was I told by a gentleman called Kit Green? Well, if anybody does a bit of research, finds out who Kit Green is. Now, he's really up on the, uh, uh, for the, with the US government on specialised and secret programmes. He's quite known in, in that field in regarding that circle. Um, and I said, no, no. I said, I'm not, Kit Green's not told me that. We've kind of come to that conclusion as, myself. So we kind of worked out when I talked with Barry about this that there's a good possibility that they're already aware of some of the stuff, if not all, a lot more than probably even us, to be honest with you. Um, but it's not in the public domain from their side. It's it's kept behind doors where, you know, myself, Barry, yourself and a few others, we're at the pinnacle of the public domain. I, I, was, gonna, I was just going to say that. I'm sorry to cut across you there, Steve. It, 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 this is kind of telling you that you're on the right path here. Uh, if, if if they're asking you questions, do you think they were trying to glean if you'd got information vital that, to them? It sounded like they, they, they wanted to know, well, how's this guy know this and who's told him? Well, nobody had told him. I don't think they'd done enough of their homework in regarding our research to find out we'd come to the conclusions ourselves. Um, it sounded to me that they are aware of the research that we're involved in and, you know, and, and the similar stuff that you do as well. And, but they don't really put it out to the public. It's like they're working within the, the circles. Um, but I explained to them, I said, well, you know what, when we, we deal with the public side, you know, we, we just put, in, we put the information out as we gather it. Uh, did, um, did you feel that they didn't like that? Do they want this kept away from... Well, it seemed friendly enough. I mean, I didn't actually get to talk with them directly. I wasn't even allowed to know who they were or, or you know, or even see them. Um, but there was about uh, about 12, 13 of these guys. And uh, I don't know who specifically the questions were coming from, but they were just asked out to me. I answered them and they were, they, they were hearing me and I'd maybe see me, but I had no idea of who they were. Yeah. And um, it was very intriguing questions. And I thought to myself, okay, these guys know something, you know, and... I guess that they just probably wanted to know where we got our stuff from. Had they, had we been told? I mean, had you know when the reference had Kit Green told you? And I thought, no, but I do know of Kit Green. It's not likely I'm going to walk into circles with Kit Green because he's right up at the top in regarding and still active within government programs. So it's. Uh, I thought, okay, well, that means Kit Green must have told somebody the same thing for him to ask that question. And I thought that's intriguing. You know, so these guys are on the same path as us. I said they they can't or do not release information to the general public, or it's done in digestible chunks, such as the narrative change and stuff. Um, and we just throw it out because <laughs> you know that's what we do. And do, do you do you think by asking you if you'd worked for MI five or some government agency, obviously you, you you just gave them the honest answer no. But if you'd have if if you had have done, do you think that they might? And we're all surmising might have thought, well, this is where Steve Muir is getting the information from. Yeah, it's an odd Well, the first question was, am I five? I mean, you know, who would you think I am, James Bond? I mean, <laughs> you're not likely to be working for MI5. And if I did work for MI5, would my answer be, would my answer be yes? No, it probably wouldn't be, would it? <laughs> so then, for, for the listeners, give them an overview of Project Doorway. What... What are you looking into, or as much detail or as little detail as you like? Yeah, well, I think quite a lot of people know where we've been with this. I mean, we've been at it now 10 years. Um, we both come from two different sides, really, the ufological side and the paranormal side. And we met in the middle, myself and Barry Fitzgerald, and uh, he's been at it for 38 years. I'm at it for 41 now. and uh, But it has to have taken that time, really. I don't think we would have... I think it's took the time to do this because... We had to gather and exhaust an area of, of, of you know, of, of a particular subject, such as the paranormal or the ufological. For me, you know, it's um, I've, I've been involved in kind of both really now, you know, very specifically over the last few, you know, at least the last twenty years. Um, 
the last 10 years is Project Doorway, but prior to that, I was working on something uh, with that in regarding SCP, the Scientific Establishment of Power Psychology, and several, well, 17 experiments, actually, the results of which is only four of them actually out, but uh, 17 experiments, and they were crazy. And now they, that they were, let me say, if I hadn't witnessed it with others, I would have never even believed it was happening. Be honest with you. Um, this is SCP. This with science, yeah. The SCP and the um, the experiments was basically about there was seance space. Now I've been involved in seances loads of times, but this was different. Um, this was a very specific test, and it was about fine tuning the circle. And it took about four months to fine tune it. Fine tuning a circle means that you know when you come to the table with a number of people, and you conduct certain experiments. And you measure the experiments, the results. And then what you do is you swap them around and you change them for other people. And then over a period of months, you're, you, you're working out who are the best group. More, more receptive. Or is it, is it receptive to certain things that you're experimenting with? Or who's best to be in the group or both? It's a bit of both, actually. It's, um, you know, because you can't seemingly, and, and Barry's re re referenced this as well, that you can't have any doubt and the circle needs believers because if you come to the circle as a skeptic it's like there's a conduit and suddenly there's a weak link and it, it's strange really because i guess that's why that certain academics in these circles who join these experiments have failed um and the good reason for that is that it's a, it's a real it's a, it's a lot of it is about mindset and after fine tuning that then you move through to your average normal seances which is you know spiritual or spirit i very loosely who were named um interactions then you kind of push through to that and you start to get things a bit like a bit like poltergeist disturbances and things like that and then you push through and push through and eventually you're trying to seek out communications with things which may not be spiritual things of another reality another domain another existence maybe you know not necessarily extraterrestrial but in maybe something kind of like non-human non intelligences yeah. if we get a hook into something then we really focus on that because it's took us a long to, a lot of time to get there but once you are there which is very interesting is that those communications we would what was happening was is the process of i mean it was it was incredible i mean the direct voices phenomenon wasn't fail wasn't male wasn't female it's it's hard to say it's it's like electronic but it's not electronic but you can't say for sure is it male or female the voice has come out the air it's always above you if you sat down it's above you if you stood up it's above you i don't know why but I'm always above you and you can pretty much target an area where that sound is coming from. <clears throat> and they would communicate very loud, vocally, but on the recordings, the recordings got them well. But when analysing the recordings, none of them were human vocal sounds, none of them within the normal frequency of human vocals. Um, and yet your ear would say it's a human vocal. Right. But it isn't, according to the analysis. Um, it's like it's generated from something that doesn't have a voice box um, or it's produced in some way. Well, you're very... hearing it audibly. You're not hearing it inside. No, you're hearing it audibly because the the um, the recordings, which were captured on recording devices, you know, device to capture harmonic sounds, 20 hertz to 20,000, captured them well. But And then we had them analysed and there were no way with the human vocals. But well, the responses were quite good. Now, what happened was, is that, as you can imagine, we were all really excited. You know, oh, wow, <laughs> you want to do this? And let's come back the next day, and let's come back the next day. And we did, we hammered it. Problem is, after about a week or so, is that we started getting things at home. And we realised that it's easy to get very excited. But the more sustained you are with the phenomenon over long periods of time, it kind of gets under your skin a little bit. And it kind of hitchhikers back home with you. You end up by having little problems and troubles, and and you realise straight away that oh, okay, it's got to be something associated to what we did. So 
there was a protocol wrote in. It was called a respite protocol. And the respite protocol was the two in five or three in seven. And, and, and it's basically, you, if it was five days you were doing it, you do it for two days. If it was in a week, you do it for three. You know, and it managed to um, sort of manage the, the situation regarding Hitchhiker because it seemed to lower and didn't take place as much then. Yeah. So because we were less involved. Do you, do you, do you think, Steve, that when you say Hitchhiker, I know, obviously, I know what you mean, but do you think it might be as as not as simple but uh, that's the only word i can think to use as simple as the actual mindset once you've engaged with well, the phenomena it's not a belief thing it's a no i know so as you're thinking about it it's almost as though even from a, from somewhere else 100 miles away across the world it, it, we think of things in terms of travel and how long it would take for things to get there, but it could be just as quick as a thought to wake this thing up and connect with you. Oh, it, the you intermind did. connect more than the the, the the thought that this thing's somehow attached to a person. I may, I may be looking at it wrong. It's just I mean, you are right. You're absolutely right, Paul. I mean, it's instant. I mean, from we did it, we were managed to do um, external experiments then whilst the sittings are taking place. And I would be on the phone 100 miles away from the sitting um, running the external experiment and asking somebody on their mobile phone to ask a question. And, you know, I mean, what have I got in my hand? That sort of thing. Right. And it was instant reply as to what I had in my hand. And you're absolutely right. It was exactly what I was holding. But it was instant. And I thought, that's okay. So that kind of, all right. So they could instantly get this information and relay this back. So I thought, okay, so that's an interesting experiment. The external ones we carried out. But, um, you know, so what was interesting is that once we built to that level, it took some time. When we go away, when we come back, we enter straight back in at that level. There was no having to build up again, you know, so it was quite sustained for quite some time. How long did it take before you you, you actually got some kind of movement, some kind of activity taking place? Um, well, I mean, for that actual, for the manifestation process, uh, it took uh, just over five months. And that's three days a week for five yeah. months um eventually though we did get there um and there were some very interesting things now if we look back at the sorrow experiments which led into the before the skull experiments then you know there's a lot of things when i because I, 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 I myself and a few others have talked to to robin freud from who ran the skull experiment and there was so much not documented in the books and I, and i agree and i totally get it i totally understand the reasons why he didn't but um, some of the information was was just, it was very hard for people to digest. And I'll give you an example that during some of these sittings, which are very well documented. And was, we're talking skull experiment now, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, even some of our own, we've had very similar things like this. But during one of these sittings, um, they were trying to find out the, capabilities and limitations of the phenomena and there was a small glass jar on the table and they watched it slowly slide across about six inches across the table which made a, made a noise and then this voice comes you know they capture this voice to say move move it over so they reach out and they pick up it move it over back to where its resting place was six inches and of course it moves again and again, they were told to reach out and put it back. Well, this time, though, when they reached out for it, they couldn't feel it. The hand went right through the glass jar. Though that the glass jar was there and was casting a shadow, it wasn't physically there in, in reality. It was, they, they, they just, and they all were laughing and thought it was fantastic that, well, they can't pick the damn thing up. And it's, it's so strange. There were no unusualities in regarding temperature differences in that location. It's just physically not there, but to the eye, it was it's real, there. physically there and cast a shadow. They can't understand it. And then after a short time, they were asked to move it again, and it was physical again and could move it back. So whatever the phenomena did, it seemed to be able to demonstrate that it can lock onto something, an individual thing, 
and change it, you know, the metaphysics of this so that it's not completely in our reality. And yet, to look at it, you'd swear it's there. So we thought, okay, well, when we cross-reference this with the stuff we do in Project Doorway, when we're looking at the UFO phenomena... That's where I was going, so you're, you're answering my question, so yeah, go on. exactly the same. I mean, how many times have we have UFOs going past aircraft? There's no wake. You know, there's no sonic booms. They're not picked up on radar. They're going into the sea or into the water, and there's no restriction from physical restriction of entering the water. They don't leave any wakes. So it's the seemingly skirt our reality. So we're seeing them. Mm. We're not fully physical in nature, just like the glass jar. People and taking so a camera up to take yeah. a picture. I can yeah. see it, but I, I've took a picture. It's not there on the camera. Yeah, well, we've had photographs and uh, we well, we'll took photographs and videos and bits and bobs of things of really interesting, but on the camera, it's like a white dot or it's mm. not even there and stuff. It's, you know, it's just like, wow, well, what we're seeing is so different than what the camera's achieving. Um, but the, the metaphysicality of this is the same metaphysical aspects that you would find in the UFO phenomena. So we started this tick sheet, in, you know, going down this tick sheet. Okay, so what else do we find? Well, we find, you know, the, the, the this same aspect in regarding apparitional phenomena in the paranormal, which seemingly walk through walls, or these UFO occupants that seemingly walk through walls, um, the aspect of paralysis, uh, bedroom visitation and um, the process of how it affects us in, in mind because these things can affect us uh, our brain waves we would have never even known if it wasn't due to experiments conducted by myself and barry that there is in fact a brainwave alteration during conscious connection with the phenomena but we do know like paul from like from the double slit or double you know the the dual slit experiments and when we're looking at something the electrons act differently so we, I queried this years ago before Project Doorway that, you know, we really truly start to look at the poltergeist phenomena and things that's projectiles. Most people will see them in flight. You try and find out, I mean, really get to the core of it and find out, did you see it move its resting place? Yeah. From that? It's usually no. It, we're, and from it, its point of origin and it's they're just appearing and it's moving. Yeah, and it's been there was a of one particular occasion. I was doing an investigation in Yorkshire with a, a couple of other investigators. It was a poltergeist investigation. It was very active there, and um, we were in sat on the set interviewing interviewing the witness, and she sat opposite us, and something caught my eye. So it's actually to my right. So, so something caught my eye, and I looked because I thought it's like I thought I saw movement. There's a chair there, and there's a cushion on a small cushion on the chair. I'm sure I saw it move. So what I did is I looked to my left, and the other investigators are also looking at it. So I thought, I said, so, so, did, did you think you saw something? And he said, yeah. So we're looking at this. It's like, go on then. Go for it. Nothing. So we kind of just left it there. We went back to talking to the, the witness, and literally within a second or two, this thing flew across the room. So we considered that, we are we somehow quantum locking it? because we're affecting it by looking at it because the electrons act differently within the cushion. If we're looking at the cushion, for example, does that sometimes interfere the action of projectiles? And we don't know, but it's a really good theory. Now, maybe it's our observation of them that's causing the lack of it taking or being captured because it doesn't. Yeah, yeah well, it could be, or, or it's so far in advance that it, it just does not want. Does what not, not want to give the game away at, yeah. at Hummanby? The guys at, at Hummanby in that warehouse they had three years from June, July, and August '96, '97, and '98 of poltergeist at UFO, even cryptid activity. But they never saw the coins drop, they saw them when the but they never saw where they came from. They yeah. saw the, the gravel dropping from, from and well, they're inside an industrial build uh, a big warehouse that you can drive buses in and lorries in with no floors above and they'd be walking and suddenly gravel would drop in front of them coins uh jars paintings nobody's throwing them there's three men in this building and they, they'd all i've spoke to all three of them they'd all experienced it nobody saw saw just as you've said steve nobody saw anything actually move from the floor into the air or drop off a side of a building nothing 
it was well, all yeah. It does happen like that. I mean, you know, I've witnessed a few times like this, and what we discover, though, a lot of the time is a lot of things seem to go across or down. You don't rarely go up, rarely. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying it's, it's rare. Even in poltergeist infestations, well, the poltergeist phenomenon is so resourceful that I think it would rather prefer to move across something across or down with gravity than against it because it takes greater you, effort. Energy. Yeah, is that what you're energy. saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it takes greater effort to defy gravity. So I think that they go with the most the most they're very resourceful. So they probably go for well this is the reaction I want. How do I get it? Well I can just do that rather than me try and you know add extra effort into it to make it uh, levitate and go upwards, you know. Um, we found many cases like that. When I was in Leicester, I did an investigation. That was a really interesting incident because a coin, which, again, didn't see where it arrived from, but it we were stood in a carpeted room, and a coin seemingly had hit the floor. But it, it sounded like it hit the floorboards, and there's no floorboard. It was carpeted. Mm. And within a, a minute, Oh, well, not even a minute. Within seconds, I get the shout out from downstairs because these investigators downstairs in the room directly below us, and a coin fell from what they claim must have been the ceiling onto the onto the floor in the kitchen. Uh, and that was interesting because they were directly below us, so it's as if the coin had come through, manifested, fallen, hit. It shouldn't have made a noise it hit the carpet but it, it sounded like it hit floorboard beneath beneath us so it's as if the car it went through the carpet and hit the floorboard underneath the carpet passed through and went and came through up downstairs and it became physical up. and became physical on the floor yeah we've got it so within seconds i mean i'm i'm not a scientist and i never will be but this thing's become non-physical by going through through yeah. a solid object and then become physical when it's hit the floor. And that's a physical phenomena, yeah. It's, it's, it is really interesting. And now some of those experiments that are taking place, there's been balls of, manifested balls of light. They're a bit, just a bit smaller than, a, than a, a tennis ball and some of them a little bit smaller than that, like ping pong size. And these would move around intelligently. And of course, if you had your mindset to you and say, you know, kind of will it to come over in your mind, they seemingly reacted to it. Um, and when landing in the hand, you, would, you wouldn't you would expect to feel anything, but you do, you feel weight, this mass. You can actually hold them in your hand. And you, you can feel this weight to it. And the, the weight is like the like feeling, I don't know if you remember, Paul, but they were, remember marbles and the dobbers, the big ones? <laughs> yeah. That's more our age here. It's about that weight in your hand, right. so you can feel it. And it's got, but it, you can't, it's so bright. I mean, it, it's it's like arc as weld lights. It's, it's that bright that the illumination from just this small thing can light up the room. It's that bright. And you can't stare at it for too long because it's so vividly bright. And we were concerned, that obviously, that people might get, you know, um, the retina burn or something. We don't know because they get retina burn in UFO stuff and lights and stuff. So... We had to be careful about retina burn, but the, the, it would move around intelligently. Is this <clears> during <throat> the SEP experiments then? Or, well, we have, we, have, we have little small balls of light. Um, they were larger and more controlled during the skull, yeah, but then it was established for a lot longer. You know, it's going on for many years. And But the balls of light, which you could feel, would come out of the hand and would go onto the table and go bang, bang, bang on the table and bounce. And then it would go through the table and then come up through the table and go through the table and come up and go bang, bang, bang again. So to us, it's like a demonstration that this is what we can do. We can change mm -hmm. the metaphysics of things. When you want it to be real in your reality as a solid item, physical item, it can be. But when we don't want it to be, it's a, and you won't know the difference, you might be able to look at it and say no difference. The aspect of it is that it's non-physical in nature and goes through solid matter until they want to switch it to. And this is, you know, you think about the UFO phenomena, sometimes they're very apparitional. Sometimes, you know, there's as if, like, are they here or aren't they here? They, you know, they manifest, they dematerialize, they materialize, just like we have that same phenomenon in the paranormal. 
But then sometimes when they want to be physical, they'll come down and land, they leave physical prints and marks on the ground. You know, and yet people have kind of got mixed up somewhere along the line and thinking, well, the UFO isn't a, an object or craft to carry the phenomena. The UFO is part of the yeah. phenomena. It is the phenomena. It's all one of the same. When when did I, I'm, I'm sorry for breaking your train of thought here, but when did you come to the the conclusion then that that all of this was bleeding into each other and 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 like you've just said, the UFO phenomena is all part. The poltergeist, everything is linked. When how long did it take? Um, it, it was around about two thousand and three. Yeah, was, um, when we finalised some of the written information. And the correlation was over 800, over 800 correlations. Mm. And that can't be by chance. It can't be. So then we started to look at the phenomenon of, UF of UFOs in a completely different manner. Instead of thinking it as it's something separate, we thought of it as it's, a, it's an aspect of paranormal phenomena. You know, so. Um, and once we started doing that, then we started to see relationships then with outside those given areas of the paranormal and UFOs, such as cryptids. We've started to find the similarities within the cryptids and correlations. And if these are all different, we are all completely different things, we shouldn't have that correlation. I mean, if we take the paranormal, and if the paranormal is an ancient earthly phenomena, which it, people like think it is, then and, and if we're dealing with something which is extraterrestrial from some other civilization, some other planet out in the distances of space, and why would we have two correlations, so many correlations here between them? You just you just wouldn't expect to have that. So once we started studying that aspect, we had to, well, you know, we didn't have all the equipment we needed then because it wasn't manufactured. We had to wait for people to be able to manufacture certain types of equipment to conduct certain tests. We always wanted to measure the brainwave during experience. Now we can do in the paranormal, we can. Because we can take people into a scientific establishment or laboratory, and uh, and put probes on the on the head and stuff, and we can measure brainwave activity quite easily. But these huge pieces of equipment on trolleys, you can't take them out about no. with you. But now, with the age of technology and specialized stuff that's been created, these things like flow bands and. You can put these on your head, and it measures your brainwave activity directly to your mobile device. And you can wear that comfortably out on location. And if you have an experience, then you can monitor your own brainwave activity. Now, that is that what Barry refers to is, is the loss of discernment. It can happen. Now, you know, we all might see UFOs, but re very rarely, you know, on occasion, they will pay interest. And if they show an interest in the individual, it's usually for a reason that that person is isolated or is in a usually a um, remote location and they think okay i'm interested in this person i know that he's watching me because i believe the ufos react to the electron shift when we're watching an observer effect uh, and they can choose at will if they want to interact or not but when they do i believe that well what was measured was 20 about 20 seconds you can lose discernment within 20 seconds of how barry's readings were just and and we don't even know if that's the fastest but if, if they've got a it's like bluetooth pairing paul that's the only way i could describe it yeah. your bluetooth pairing negates this phenomena it's interested in you but when you do that your brainwave starts to change and it puts you into like a theta brainwave state which is very manipulative it's like can you really discern what is what you're seeing and experiencing under those conditions? Because it's those conditions is like light sleep or daydreaming process. It's in theta. So, and I think they put they do that purposely, so that the option is there to can maybe manipulate something if control. you want yeah. control. And secondly, you lose completely. You, you, and we didn't know that your your cognitive limitations. And this yeah. is you don't you know. This is why people don't take phone. Can't you, hold you, the you're take kind a of beating me to every question. I was just going to say this is why people don't take pictures. And and it, 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 it's a kind of it sounds weak when you say it to somebody when they punch that one out at you. Why didn't you take a picture if you if you were looking at it for five minutes? Why? 
and these are the reasons. But yeah, and you're absolutely spot on. Well, it's the phenomenon it does grab you. I mean, I've I've been in the car and driving down a road with 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 a partner, and something comes right in front of us, right in front of the car, and I'm thinking, what the hell was that? And it's going over in my head. And, I, and why don't it's me, Paul? I'd be out the car and mm. just, I'd be straight out after the damn thing. I don't do anything for half a mile. And then after half a mile, I kind of, did you just see that? Did you just see something strange? And the brakes get slammed on. Oh my God, we, we saw that as well. None of us were allowed to react at the time. So this is how they, I think the phenomena can control our actions under those conditions, and it doesn't release us until it's ready to release us, to act normally. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, honestly, it's, I, I'm sure I'm as fascinated as everybody else listening to this, Steve. It's great, as, as always, listening to what you've got to share. I just want to go back to skull experiment. I mean, obviously, you, don't, you might not want to talk in any detail, and I know your your project doorway is slightly different, but... You talked about things that some things that were manifesting, some things that were people were experienced du in experiencing during the skull experiment were never talked about. What what were those what were those things or any of them or did, would yeah. you rather not say? Uh, well, I can I can say some. I mean, Robin's not with us anymore. Bless him. Anyway, no. Well, you know we, we're. we're we're attempting something similar with one of the guys. Well, I'll not say his name, but he, he probably the last person to spend time with Robin. I know that he went out and lived lived with him for a while with his yeah. wife. So we will be well, starting that. It's an usual tell. I mean, I, I knew of Robin. Um, I was in touch with the team, with Robin and some and two members of the team. Um, I talked with him on a number of occasions, and I was very aware of what was publicly out in the domain. But then you have to kind of, when you, after a while, you, you, you can get people to open up and talk a bit more, especially when they're interested in the work that we're doing. And I was working on project, um, Phenomena Project at the time, which is about a bit like advanced studies of Skull. And we were sharing information with him. And he shared information to, with us, which is not in a public domain. Um, some of these experiments, which, which weren't, it was too much to put into the books. Because at the time the books were coming out, you know, they they were being scrutinized by the scientific um, you know, the, the, the big wigs who had been invited to the skull experiments and all witnessed the phenomena firsthand. Those videos are up on YouTube. You can watch them, you can see their affidavits, the you know, the, the vocal affidavits of interaction with the phenomena, and they could not explain it. It is really is profound. Now a lot of those things that weren't documented at that time was for good reason. <clears throat> it, they they were satisfied for a number of years just dealing with what they were referring to loosely as the spiritual phenomena. I'll tell you why in a minute, why I call it that. You know. But um, after a while, they, they wanted to push through and communicate with things not of this world as they wanted other things to communicate with. After some time, they managed to communicate with things not of this world. But the problem in doing that was they started to lose control over the circle. And anybody who's maintaining a circle knows it's about control in that circle uh, and maintaining it. However, they lost control over the circle once they started dealing with these things. Now, they wanted to come, they were coming through in multiples. I mean, a very lot wanted to come through. So there was like a bit of a rush. And they started to have these experiences with photographing them and occasionally even sighting them. That wasn't documented about the sighting of these things. In fact, it's never been documented that these things never left Robin. They stayed with him for the rest of his life. So he started to have experiences of that nature through the process of seance. And uh, they were with him. He, he said it. They would, they've always been with me. Never left. Couldn't get rid of the damn things afterwards. There was, you know, even if closing down, they did close down the circle because 
they stated in the books that um, they were concerned about the timeline. It's a little bit more than that, but that's the best they could come up with for the book. Um, it gets very complicated, but it was about it was a matter of losing control, and that was the pro that was the problem for right. them. Um, and of course, the phenomenon, you know, like many other experiments, uh, Bacchi in Italy, there's similar types of experiments. You know, the the aspects of the physicality here. Um, they had a, a small tape recorder. You know, the old eighties tape recorders where you put big cassettes in. Big yeah, do, yeah. I used to love them. I used to, that's all I had when I first started. That and a compass and a pen and a pad. <laughs> and things have changed. Um, well, they were recording and asking questions, and it was they couldn't hear it until they played back the cassette and it captured responses to the questions they're asking. This isn't random. Most people go out there paranormal investigating to get an EVP, they randomize comments. Yeah. It's like a, a little piece of a sentence or communication between someone else. It's it's just random, doesn't mean much. Very rarely do you get responses. And when it does, it becomes from AVP to AVP's actual voice phenomena. So you're actually asking a question, getting an answer. And what was really interesting is that they pulled the power plug out one day, just as a test. So the cassette's not going round. And yet what happened was when they asked the question, they took the cassette out and played it in another recorder. And just after the, the you know, they said this question, this tape recorder uh the sorry this cassette picked up a vocal response on it and yet it wasn't even going round so they thought well it shouldn't be anything on the tape recorder because on the on the cassette because it can't have captured it no so they thought okay so they even re remo the removal of the the um recording head as well as the as well as the power and it still it worked out actually it didn't even need the damn tape recorder put a tape recorder over there we'll just put the cassette on the side and it transplaced it. It's a transplacement phenomenon. This is what we de discovered through the um, uh, phenomena project, the, the, the phenomena of transplacement. And it, to transplacing it straight onto that. And this is how it happened with Baki and his radio. You know, they put it in this massive big Faraday cage, which was purposely built to shield out anything. And yet it still bellowed through. They even took the tubes out the radio and it's still bellowed through. It's, it's, it's bypassing the physics of what we understand. So then we look at the UFO side of things. There has been on some occasions nuclear warheads, which have been disarmed, disarmed or messed with by UFOs. Um, some of them are, are, are basically interacted with by the phenomena and causes some type of disruption in it electronically. Some have actually been physically damaged. Now, if you see a warhead, there's no screws and bolts. You can't get in it. And that's for safety reasons. So nobody comes along with it. I'm going to get in the warhead. There's no <laughs> way it's completely sealed. Under the investigation of why these happen, very similar to VI effects, which is your vehicle interference. Sometimes there's physical damage. And I said, well, how can that happen? How can he apply something and cause physical damage in such a closed area, which is not accessible? And we thought, well, it can if you think about the tape recorder situations and, and yeah. back. It's the same thing. It's just utilised in a different way. Do, what does that tell us then? It's telling us that this is highly intelligent and it highly advanced. But are we dealing then, do you think, Steve, with the same phenomena that people dealt with hundreds of years ago? Uh, because obviously, and is it just? Is it just? reacting and evolving not evolving because it wouldn't have to evolve if it's this intelligent is it just adjusting as we as human beings become more advanced i think that where we the problem is is us i think the problem is humanity trying to put things in these damn boxes it's been an, it's not been beneficial for us at all i mean we're dealing with a phenomena that has godly power and it does because it can manifest in many many different ways it can break all the laws of physics. It can take control of our, our our physical beings. You know, it can manifest within us. It can interact in ways that we couldn't even understand. It's godly. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look through the Bible, that is godly power. Yeah. Now, since the beginning of time, there seems to have been an interaction from 
various deities. In fact, India, people, you know, there's a question somebody wants asked, how many gods do, do, does India have? Um, it has over 3 million, believe it or not. Three, 3 million varied gods in India. And you look around all the, all the other world, there's so many different deities, you know, and when you try and find out the source of the information, it's like, well, you go to the holy caves, and this is where one of these non-human beings, non-human intelligences, were seen and referred to as a deity because that's how the best they thought they must be, must be some type of god. We worship it, and they do, and they still do because this phenomenon loves to have a flock, really, really does, and we know that because. If we go back to the research that Barry did on Lords, the Lords is one of the most religious locations on planet Earth. Millions of people visit it every single year. And it's become a highly religious site. And it was started off with the sighting of something in a cave entrance. Do you like caves, funny enough? There's also a geological connection to this phenomenon. And if you go there, you'll see the entrance of the cave and a statue of our Virgin Mary, our Lady Virgin Mary, there which they put there, representing what had been seen there. Well, St. Benedict, when she re reported it, she, you know what she referred to it? That thing. That's what she said. That, so, that so, thing. And we've put our interpretation on what that well, thing is. The church has. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. The church has definitely done this. And, you know, there's Professor Diana Pulaska now, and she's had, you know, my dream come true. She had access to the Vatican Archive, unattended, that is, for three days. Oh my God! What would what would I do? Well, I tell you what, she did what I'd, I would have done. I went. I would have gone straight to the source archive and looked at these biblical incidents of angels and, and cupids and, and cherubs and you know the Virgin Mary. When she started to look at them, none of them were not one of them. They were all non-human intelligences, balls of light, strange craft, interactions, people burnt by beams of light that came through or injured. And what they did is, he even interpreted that as, well, you were, you held your hands up in absolute fear as this light came down from this object. It hit him, hit him on the hands like St. Francis of Assisi, right there, to guard himself, burnt his hands. Was it radiation? Don't know. Well, the church took that and said, oh, let's change it to stigmata. Yeah. And it did, and it became the Christ wounds. You know, and then what they don't tell you is that he was a, one of the first people on planet Earth to create a flying saucer cult, funny enough, after his incident. But uh, he was badly affected, and so many others. You know, trees of a veil. I mean, she's like, look at the diaries. She says, well, this thing, three foot tall, not human, appeared in the room. It had some type of long device in its hand, like some type of prong or something. Doesn't sound very nice, but she wrote it exactly as she said it in the in the diary. It thrusted it up her entrails. I don't sound very nice. <laughs> We've heard about those sort of things before. It was a horrific experience for her. So yeah. what did the church do? Well, the church got the details and they said, okay, well, we'll twist it around and we'll turn that creature into a cherub. And the prod became cherub's dart. Yeah. Or Cupid's arrow. Same thing. Yeah. Eventually, that got changed in statues to the dove and the partridge, and that became the Holy Spirit. And these images of the Holy Spirit with beaming lights down onto people and stuff. So we have to really question: Is like, have we? Been, what is has has God been hijacked? Is the name yeah. God been hijacked? For this phenomenon. We've all around the world got various different views about. We've, well, and that's basically what's happened back then, isn't it? We've been duped or, by some scholar's narrative or, or belief of what this should be. I didn't think we'd be talking about stigmata. We'll go to questions in five, ten minutes, but you touched on stigmata then and, and holding the hands up and probably stigmata. But how do we attribute then modern-day accounts of stigmata? Is that the power of the human mind that's able to somehow inflict these wounds? What, what was oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the physical wounds that people got from having these experiences with these beams of light coming down from these crafts and stuff. And sometimes they were injured. I mean, we know that happened in Kolaris, didn't it? I mean, over a thousand, 1,200 people affected and six, I think, died from those incidents. Um, the thing is, is that the church likes to put their own slant on it. And stigmata is a real thing, yeah. But it's it, it's it's the 
it's the psychological governing the physiological body because the thought is yeah. stronger you know than, than than physical reality and isn't it always been like that in this subject power of this power of this and if you believe in something because there's experiments done years ago on the hypnosis where they put a coin on their arm and told them it was hot and when they lift it up it blister you know so the, if you believe in it and that that's it but i mean i think around about 1975 76 some heavy researchers by scientists started looking into stigmata and the historical side of the crucifixion or crucifixion of the Christ. And they, they realized that, they, you know, it's not a Christian thing, the cru crucifixion or crucifixion. It's, uh, it's actually Sumerian. It actually goes back to Sumerian days. And there's actually these statues, Babylonia, Babylon, the same thing used for invocation to interact with this phenomena and not just the paranormal, the ufological yeah. stuff as well. And it showed images and statuettes and things of them, of them you know, crucifying. It, that's where it came from. But it would never have been through the palm because your palm's too fleshy and not got yeah. enough bone there to support. It would have been through the two bones here yeah. in the wrist. And that's how they would have done it in Roman times. And it wouldn't have been a cross shape, actually neither funny enough it's just the process of that um however when that became submitted to the vatican the vatican said we agree with that scientifically you know they have to yes okay yeah we we agree with that then it was documented and it got out and when people started to well the vatican believed that and it was interesting that quite a high percentage of the phenomena relocated itself from there to the wrist yeah you see because it's thought induced how powerful is is thought and consciousness i think we underestimate it especially when dealing with this phenomena i 100 percent agree so so obviously we can move away from skull and and the other things but however just temporarily before we go to questions how d d how much of, of an influence do you think the, the 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 knowing going from belief to the knowing when you were performing these experiments and when skull were involved did it did it enhance the phenomena to come through uh, do, do, the, the, you know using a Ouija board not advocating the use of the Ouija board but using a Ouija board that everybody that goes into the use of it a group of people the the, the, the most of them in, are of the mindset that spirit can be contacted so mm -hmm. the Ouija board's not special it's not the it's not the golden child but it's a it's a conduit for which they can contact it and then when they get a little bit of movement it almost starts amoeberish almost like poltergeist activity and you get a little bit of something and then you switched on because you didn't do it i didn't do it who did this and you believe you you, you, you your, your belief becomes stronger and so it grows it grows it, it, it grows and multiplies and and the, you, you go from believing to knowing and suddenly you're involved you're immersed in it How, so yeah, it, it requires us, Steve. Does that well, guess what I'm saying? Is it requires there's no, us. Phenomena, there's no phenomena without experimenters. Absolutely, you are absolutely spot on. Yeah. I mean, if you look, just look at Gary Nolan, you know, he quotes into the as a scientist, comes into the subject, highly skeptical, and starts, okay, I'm gonna start researching the effects on physiological indiv individuals. I've had it, you know, experiences with this phenomenon, not just the UFO stuff, because when he first came out, we were thinking. That could be the effects of G-force on the brain, you know, causing certain seizures or white matter disease, as he wants to refer to it. But when you start to see it in close experiences of the paranormal, it's a whole kettle, different kettle of fish. You start to realize, okay, there's something that's happening to people who are long-term experiencers or have had, had a very close, significant experience. Something in the brain is slightly different. And they've actually localized the low, the low, they know the location of the brain that's actually affected through paranormal and ufological experiences. Why the same thing? Again, another connection was only discovered two years ago um, in 2022. Interestingly, though, this is a skeptic. As soon as you started getting into that, I was very surprised uh, about four months ago, see a, a video interview with him where he said, I'm having experiences. Yeah. Yes, because this phenomenon requires, it's like faith apparitions. It's like 
it's like a bit like a religion. You've got to believe it. Yeah. Nobody will have a faith apparition if they don't believe in religion. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. You have to believe it for it to work. It's like the circle that we have. It has to be by people who are believers and not a skeptic because it won't work. You've got to accept this, and that's halfway there. Yeah. And then it's down to them if they want to, but at least we've got to meet them on the level playing field. And to do that, we can't walk to that circle um, being sceptical. You've got to be open and believe. A few years ago, uh, we, we interviewed Jim Segala, who'd been at Skinwalker. Absolutely great bloke, and a really nice man to talk with, so knowledgeable, the scientist. And he, I couldn't, I didn't want him to commit to believing in anything. Obviously, it's got to be up to individual, but it were all scientific data that he were producing. And basically, he, he, he kind of sidestepping the, the phenomena in a way, even though he was involved in the project at Skinwalker. And uh, we, we, we interviewed him about two months ago. He's had an experience. He's having experiences. You know, he didn't go into great detail, but his his mindset has changed slightly. And that's as much as I'd say for about Jim, because I won't want to try and speak for him. But yeah. I, I did ask him and, and he said he said he had and that they yeah, had do. experiences. You do Which want your experience, don't you? You can switch. But, the, you know, it was, it was scientists that put forward the hypothesis of seeing is believing. Before that, it was the opposite way around. It's believing so it's is seeing. seeing. Because if you believe it, you can experience it. And, and the science said, oh, no, you can't, can't have belief in there because we could be fooling ourselves. Well, no, because belief is, you know, we have, we, we have it in, in religious connotation. Faith healing, for example, mm -hmm. works. There's plenty of evidence to support faith healing, the power of prayer, you know. But it's not the prayer. It's the, it's the like you said before, it's, it's all the, about consciousness and belief. And it's very, very powerful. And this phenomenon latches onto it, has a good understanding of it. And don't get me wrong, you know, I mean, it can pick and choose as it wants. We're puppets on a string to this phenomenon. We really are. Um, and we've been, we, we're kidding ourselves if we've got any form of control over this godly power. Absolutely not. Um, and, and, of course, the demonstration of technology is also very interesting because it is like, yes, they, there is technologies. And when it comes to phenomena, being present and left in our physical reality, such as apportations. We do realize now that the apportation of items um, might likely not have been the original item, it disappeared. And right, second, but just on that note, I item. know where you're gonna go with this, Steve, and we can pick that up if that's okay with you afterwards. We'll pull Les in and see if we've got some questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. We'll just, uh, thanks, Les. Yeah. Uh, Great show, guys, and uh, thank you very much, Steve, for coming on the uh, channel tonight. So we've got some great questions in, as usual. Uh, I'm looking at 22 questions on my list so far, so I'll start off with... Oh, we might uh, not be talking about hotels then tonight. <laughs> 20, I'll start off with uh, Mac Jones. Steve, do you think death is not the end of existence? I, I think it's, it's death is the, the end of a physical existence. I mean, what we, I mean, we, we want to split it into spirit and soul and physical self spirit soul and self it's the trinity it's a whole trinity really the um it's well documented it goes back some time but the you know the the, the aspects are currently how we how we want to believe it you know the the all aspects of you know the devil and the and the hell and stuff was was a controlling factor that religion is generated to control masses um at the end of the day um but the the, the fundamentals of most religion is that death isn't uh, is a process just as becoming alive is a process it's the same thing everything in everything in our reality recycles if you even everything goes round and round the galaxy the universe everything so why not us we're part and parcel of the universe and the galaxy and the planet earth so i believe that it's a, it's a recycling process but i do think there's a spiritual tether between one life and another and hence people have you know those incidents of uh, re, you know reincarnation thoughts what a great answer thanks yeah, for that, great answer, that fantastic and uh, i don't know if this is a question you can answer uh, steve from soul adatic hello steve what whatever happened to don phillips 
Uh, I'm still working with Don Phillips. He's part of um, um, Phenomena Project. In fact, I just finished a large project with him, yeah. uh, which will be televised this summer on Unsolved Mysteries. That was a bit of a maybe should have said it, but you know what? It's it's it's, it's coming. So it's uh, and it's the longest episode they've ever done. Well, you have not given any details away, Steve, have you? You, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Debbie Shaw is asking, uh, could Steve tell us the account about the experiencer who saw a white horse as a me of a, as a screen memory? About an expert, about an experiencer who saw a white horse as a screen memory. Yeah. And, uh, and, oh, well, that'll be me. <laughs> That's me. I mean, I'll, I'm assuming she's talking that Jessica's talking about me when we are. Well, 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 Deb's put the Deb's put the question in just as fielded them to Les, but I just, I'm assuming, and Deb's very knowledgeable uh, on on subject, so she probably already does know it's you. So uh, just fill well, it. yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely yeah, it was me. I mean, that was I had multiple experiences since I was seven years of age when I first started. The first experience was a bedroom visitation, but as I got older, I realised two things. The first thing is that reading books, this phenomena will disengage from me as a individual um, initiated experience from seven years of age, round about probably 18, 19, late teens, when you start getting into girlfriends and work and all that sort of thing. And it didn't with me. It just kept on plowing right through and still, and still does, so it's never left. But I had many different experiences um, when I was young, and one of them when I was in, in the back garden, we had a, a, a large, about most, I mean, I say large, it's probably about seven or eight foot, but it looked massive to me as a kid. And it was just in the corner, it was a laurel bush, and it, there were very thick green leaves. You couldn't really see into the laurel bush, it was, they're so dense. And um, I heard a noise, and a, a horse's head popped out, and it was a white horse, and it was a horse's head. And I was like, <laughs> How does a horse fit in there? What is that? And it used to it used to ask me questions. And it happened three times, and then I never saw it again. But it used to freak me out a little bit because it never it never moved its mouth, and yet it spoke to me. And it was a white horse head and neck come out of the laurel bush. And yeah, that was definitely me. That was a weird one. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, so look, Steve and. Uh, from Michael Park, can you ask Steve if he's going to do any more research on the island of the dead? Yeah, yeah there are some things in the pipeline, as well as uh, the Devil's Acre, which I was there in October with Barry. And it's a small island in Ireland, a small island in Ireland, but it's also a very potent magnetic region. It's also a UFO manifestation location, paranormal, and this small little lake that goes round it these giant serpent things have been seen enough to scare people half to death two of them that's apparently been reported i think from what barry told me and whilst we were there we were just literally around the corner from that location we'd been there and done some research there, and we were and check it out and there was something seen in the sky by all these people and uh we asked these people what did you see and he said it was like a, a ufo it was a ufo and um, and whatever this thing was, it was heading off back straight to that location, you know. So it's um, that was the island. Of, um, that's the uh, the Devil's Acre. Very weird place. But uh, Ireland's got full. Was full a lot of. Is I mean I've travelled around the world and been in some crazy places, but Ireland really does top the list. It really does. It is still a lot of active stuff there. How many? Uh, a question from me. This one, Steve. How many ley lines cross uh, Ireland itself? Is the a lot? Does it crisscross? Is uh, ley lines anything to do with the phenomena, Stu? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, some are. Uh, it's not the, it's not the lays. That are, it's, it's, it's the locations, magnetic locations, um, such as magnetic lays. You know, we had ancients recognise them because they were more connected than we are. We've been a little bit since then. Um, so there, there are all over the place. But then it depends on how far you go back. And more you go back, there's more of them, you know. So it's, yeah. you know, a lot, a lot, lost a lot of history as to where these things are. It is interesting, though, that uh, about 76% of military industrial facilities that are utilised for weapon manufacture or chemical weapon manufacture have been relocated to places mm -hmm. like that. 
especially like around Stonehenge and stuff. Stonehenge is a very negative place. You know, I've seen kids playing in there and stuff, you know, on sunny days when you've got loads of people there. And I think, well, you sat on a sacrificial stone. It's a blood sacrificial stone. That. That's, it's not, you're not a much love and light at Stonehenge, unfortunately. And there's places like that. But that's what the deities like. They like that. They like sacrifice. Our own God did that. You know, it's, you know, there's a look in the Bible, the Old Testament. He had his bad days. He'd smite people. He'd have to offer your sons to him, sacrifice them occasionally. No different to that deity than any other deity. It's as with another one then, Les. Yeah, Gavin's still crazy. Steve, what is the best evidence you have seen regarding portals? Uh, and there is there is some that take place indoors, there's some that take place outdoors. Don't always think that they always take it place outdoors. Some don't. Some take place indoors, which are seen as a dark mass which grows and you can see varied images. I was actually only on the phone to somebody else the other day, uh, only two days ago, I had the same experience. Um, and, uh, and a large seven foot, very, very skinny, black shaped figure came out of it and, uh, and walked off into another room and faded away. But, you know, so it's all down to what we want to really refer to as portals. But I think the best one is he's been in Ireland and, um, I remember saying Barry was there saying you can see a completely different scene in the background. It's like a, um, a ring and it's you can literally see right through to a different background. It's not the same trees or background you expect to see. We're in the middle of a forest next to a lake. Um, and one woman who was there went out close to it from what I remember. Um, went out to it and Barry was a bit don't, don't go near it and she got whatever what, what it was like zapped or something but he threw her like she had electric shock or something but he threw yeah. her older so um but I, there are things that we're aware of in ancient sites and in desert locations where these things come through most I would say if I don't like using the word portals um <coughs> X points or you know geological um, electron diffusion regions is the is the proper name is um some of them we don't see they're just um utilized by the phenomena where ufos will seemingly just appear it can be quite a vast area where they suddenly it's always in that place it's place in the sky there where lights will suddenly appear and they'll move around and then they suddenly disappear mm. you know it's like there's like these little footprint areas around in in the sky it's like there was a very good book it was all called holes in heaven and then he's, he's basically talks about the still sort of And they literally do just appear, just like you've just said there, Steve. They don't fly from anywhere. They just appear and disappear. We, we've seen that. Yeah. Just before Les goes to the next question, and I know he's going to be there with it in a minute, if there's any questions that are asked and you think, I'd like to expand on this, but we're doing quick-fire questions, just tell us and we can do it afterwards. So, yeah, go on, Les. Yeah, and then just sort of like uh, punching on that portals questions, uh, the question there, uh, Paul, you had uh, an account from, was it a couple of Benson Cliffs again? Yeah, uh, it where was, where it was a glass tunnel, was it a glass tunnel that was yeah. talking about? That was Sally, Sally uh, yeah. Ev um, Everington and her, and her husband, and they walked, they're walking down the cliffs, but there are more reports in the same area, Steve, so you, you spot, foot, spot on footprint areas. And as they're walking down this path, I, th I think husband were in front of her. It doesn't matter if it's wrong road round, but suddenly she became aware that everything had closed down. The sound of the sea, the sounds of the seabirds, it, uh, it just felt weird. And she said to her husband, okay, have, can, have you noticed this? He goes, yeah, I have, yeah, yeah. He says, and then they sort of walked out of it and walked back in. They turned round and walked back and it had gone. They just had that moment, that moment of sort of this lower silence and this high strangeness a mile down the coast. And that's what I thought you were on about, Les. Mm. And I'm sorry to butt in because it's Steve Shaw. This not mine, but it's interesting. Lisa and her husband went for a walk to speed and they went looking for fossils. It's an incredible area for fossils. Lovely summer's day. I think she said 2018. She might even be in chat here. And they're walking up the beach, low tide. It gets very little footfall at speed. And she says, but there's a couple and a young boy playing football on the beach simply because it's so inaccessible. You've got to walk a mile before you actually get to the beach. 
and, and, if, and unless you go down from the village and then it's a 400 foot incline so she said as we're walking up you can see this oval hung uh, like a lozenge shape about three foot deep two foot wide and it's about three or four foot off floor myself and chris turner have already filmed lisa on the beach telling us about this she said it just looks like a mirror she says and it's all iridescent she said it's like oil on water it's she, you'd find it hard to describe so close that they could walk around it they thought at one point the young boy before they got before they got up to it were going to run into it and it, it seemingly he couldn't see it and they're mesmerized she says i'm looking up the cliffs and we got like three to four hundred foot. She says, thinking somebody got some and the, the projecting it, but it's not projecting from the floor and bouncing back like a reflection. This is a sunny day and it's just hung and we walk around it. Incredible stories. That is that what people would call a portal? I'm I'm a bit insane. I can't camp I've never seen anything like that. That's really a profound one. Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a high strangeness in soon. And what I do know is that. When we did some work in with, with the manifestation X points, we, we kind of nickname it X points where these lights seem to appear and come in and different stuff. It's hard to get triangulation, especially if you're on a coast, because you would need somebody out there at sea to, be able to triangulate properly. If it happens on land and you can get a good triangulation, you can get that from the UFO DAP project. They, they do that sort of stuff. It turns out that little piece in the sky, you don't know how far away they are. No. So the further the way they are, the piece in the sky gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if they're so far out, if they're 26 miles out, then that could be a 40 to 60 mile radius in the sky. You take that 40 or 60 miles, because what happens above happens below, yeah. and place that 40, 60 mile to the ground, you might look at a circumference of an area that's infected, yeah. which might be like Bempton, for instance. You, 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 you're so right, and I'm, I'm sort of just deflecting from questions, but we were, uh, uh, me and Pete were on cliffs about, uh, uh, he'll remember the date, but it's about a month ago, and the first time these lights had appeared for a long time, and we get a phone call from 22 miles away from a guy ringing me to say he's in the village, and, and this is a real village name, people, and you'll laugh when it's called Wet Wang, and he's in the village of Wet Wang on the East Yorkshire Wolds, and he rang me up, and he says, Paul, I'm looking at lights in the direction of Bempton. I said, we're filming them now over the sea, and the conversation's there, you know? So, the, yeah. the distance that, and you're talking about triangulation, which is important, that's why you, you need a team of people around you, really, don't you? You, you, you? Yeah, you need you need monitoring stations. I mean, they can be done electronically through the UFO DAP program. That can be done. But it's very hard to get it from people because they're not always out there all the no. time. You know, you, you need to be instrumentally detected, really. But when you can do and you work out, then because people are thinking, oh, it's just up in the sky or over there. Well, that's about like a mile out. You know, well, the, according to UFO data, no, it was it was actually um, something like uh, twenty one miles away. Well, if it's twenty one miles away, that area in the sky is vast. Yeah. So, and then you think because you don't know how large the lights are, you know, and of course the they're so bright sometimes that they can be more, you know, the physic if it's a physical object at the core of it. Its illumination can be seventy eight percent larger than the actual object. Yeah. So you might be looking at a light like this for something like that. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Do you want another question, please, Les? Yeah. Okay. Um, Adam Sando is asking uh, Steve, do you think the poltergeist or ghost activity can originate unknowingly from the observer? Unknowingly, well, there is an oh, yeah. Well, you can get certain people through experiments as found out in parapsychological studies that there are some which have the capabilities of manipulating objects through the power of the mind. Usually, though, under certain circumstances, it was females more than males at age between 11 and 16, and um, usually going through some, some form of traumatic situation and their adolescence. 
And that was when you got the highest readings from people who might be, it's what you refer to as uncontrolled forms of PK. When you say uncontrolled, it's like they're not even aware that they were doing it themselves. So yes, you might refer to that as some type of poltergeist action, but there's no rule book because the SPR will say, oh, well, you know, poltergeists all, all need a catalyst and a focus. No, they don't. That's not true. It's not written in stone. And we know of cases, even I've done cases where you remove the people, these phenomena remains. So, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I think it can happen with certain individuals. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, let's have a look. I know you've talked about this a little bit earlier in the show, uh, Steve. Uh, Steve, is uh, this similar? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing about your new experiment there. Is this similar yeah. to Skull that Nick Carl discusses? Yeah, let me tell you the process, the, the <laughs> Build it out for you. Okay, so we've got um, Sorret, then the Philip experiment, Sorret experiment, Philip experiment, Skull experiment. Yeah. Then the advanced studies of Skull, which Nick Kyle was involved in, then project, uh, then phenomena project, and then into Project Doorway. And all Project Doorway's done is took exactly what was there before and implemented the ufological phenomena to it. Um, so that's it. So, so Nick is a good friend of mine, and we've done work together. Yeah. Um, he was involved in, in, in the skulls sittings as well, but it was more the advanced ones as, you know, skull had shut down, but then it kind of came up again secretly in certain locations. Um, some of those experiments who took place um, in Scotland, or um, some of those took place in Spain, you know, the further studies, but initiated in Norfolk in Skull. Always, and it always has to be underground, Paul, if you want to be successful, by the way. Oh, yeah. Shit. We will we'll be doing well. I spoke to you a few weeks ago. We'll be in a basement, you know. Brilliant. Okay, and uh, let's have a look then. We've got uh, Mark Anderson. Uh, I don't know which uh, part of the conversation Mark was uh, alluding to. Here. Steve, are you suggesting they are in some form of supposition? Supp supposition. supposition. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've got to understand about the reality around us. We know very little of. Now, with the pressing studies of quantum physics now, and quantum mechanics, we're starting to realize about the reality we live in. And now, according to specialists and professors in this, and quantum, don't get me wrong, quantum mechanics has been going on for a long time, sort of early 60s, you know. It's not something new. It's been going on for some time. What, they, what these people, these specialists are saying now is that Nothing exists until we experience it. I mean, we might be all sat watching our computer screens, but upstairs, your bathrooms don't exist. Not until you go upstairs and experience it. That's what they're saying. Nothing in reality exists until we experience it. If that is the case, then what and how does that work? And therefore, what is it that can manipulate it? I had a very long conversation a few weeks ago with specialists on you know, who are in um, doing research and, and stuff. And it, the discussion was about free will and predestination. And I said, I don't think we have it. Because during these sittings, we've been told information about where we're going to be in 18 months to the day. And it was, you'd no way think you're going to be there. It was something, you know, they're not going to turn around and say you're in Tesco's getting a van of tin of beans. You know, it was like, well, you're going to be in this other country and you're going to be doing this. I'm like, no, I've never been to that particular place. And why would I? Never be on that day we were exactly. And it's not the first time they've done this and told us about future events. So they rather know because some people say, Oh, do you know what? I can change all that. I can just go out my gate and I'll take a left instead of I'll take a right. And you'll that's it, I'll bug you up. No, because a new predestination will take place. Exactly. So do we have free will or is this phenomena? Manipulating reality for it to happen, or it's aware it's already going to happen, and it's just telling or, them. Or, or as our what we call reality already being planned, and everything that we do, everything that I'm saying right now, is <laughs> is in a script, and yeah. and I don't know, you know, it's it's, it's, it's really hard to to really it is hard to wrap your head around it, but it's there's so much we don't know, and very little we do, to be honest. Mm, spot on. Yeah, do you want one more question? I think so, Les, because some I mean, people will be disappointed if they're not getting these questions out. But are you okay with these, Steve? Fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get my knuckles wrapped most weeks, Paul. So um, 
Yeah. Right then, uh, Gavin's still crazy. Steve, have you ever had any sleep paralysis or shadow shadow men encounters? I've had sleep paralysis once in my life, and that was because, and it was proper proper sleep paralysis. Um, I was extremely tired. I'd been up about 48 hours, and I was taking somebody to a house. I had to wait for them. It was a beautiful sunny day, and the sunlight was coming through, and I was tired, and I shut my eyes. And I heard him get in the car, and I, my body was asleep, but my mind was awake because I can hear him talking to me, and I couldn't move. I couldn't wake myself up until he actually shut my arms in. And, I, you know, so that, that is sleep paralysis, and it's true sleep paralysis. However, shadow man encounters, well, yeah, I've had quite a few of them in my time. I've had ones which um, which aren't very nice at all, which actually grab hold of you, you know, and you end up bloody wrestling with them. But the... Um, yeah, but all sorts of things like that. <laughs> Many times. I was actually going to put you on spot. Not not put you on spot. Wrong thing to say. I was actually going to say after the questions, so it could have rolled on from there. Are you? Well, are, are, do you think you'll talk more about your own experiences in the future? Well, I did it at first, and I remember you coming to me and talking about you know night people about about you know you were considering bringing it, you know this book out, and you asked me. I remember that day, Paul, and you asked me about you know. Do you, do you think it's yeah. and i said to you yeah i said you know it's is it back in the day the times have changed you know when i was going through tutoring and you know learning about this stuff and everything my mentor said to me in the early 80s that oh you know you don't ever talk about your experiences because you know it, it, you might be considered biased in you regarding your conclusions but that switched it's completely the other way around now because by experience it, I know what witnesses are going through. Uh, though that I don't, you know, I wouldn't sit there and interview somebody and sort of big it up and say, oh, I've had that. Oh, yeah, I don't know what you mean. And, and which, you know, that's not the investigation process. But it's good for me because it arms me with extra knowledge that, okay, I understand what this person's seen. I understand what this person's witnessed. Um, you could say I'm an experiencer. But I don't really like the word because I think it's life. I think it's just, I don't think there is any experiences. I think we all experience life in different ways, you know, but I wouldn't want to separate people, you know. Um, but yeah, they, they've been plentiful for some and none for others. And I don't know why, um, multiple reasons probably. But at the end of the day, the phenomenon knocked on my door. I didn't go knocking on it, you know. But it would never let me get back on track to you any other way. So, um, so I'd say, yeah, you know, uh, I, those experiences have been plentiful. And it's interesting because this phenomenon acts like a virus. It passes on. You can spread it to, you, to your close, in your close circle, and they can start to witness it. It's like a virus. You, you, once again, I'll not say who it is because he might, he might actually say that one me. There's somebody in chat. And I was talking to them recently about this, and he said it's con it's a contagion. He says it's contagious. Yes. He says, and I took this with me, and when the things were happening to me, and I went and spoke to some friends, and never told them. And I know, well, I know, he's, I know he's listening to this, and I know he's probably going to go back to me. It's interesting because I though I can't say because we've got a new book coming out next year, myself and Barry. It's in, his title, "Staring Into Darkness." And we know now where it's coming from, and we know, we know exactly because it's we've got the bit the evidence and we've got scientific proof, and we've got scientists that are on board about it. That you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot more going on than what we think, and we are we are the direct connection to this. Without us, no phenomena. But, but yeah, and as in we, you don't mean Steve Mirror and Barry. You, you mean all the human, race. Yeah, the yeah. human race. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll just leave this session with uh, this uh, from Dippy Do and. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I love Paul Sinclair's Truth Proof and Podcast. The the uh, tenors in the post, uh, Dippy Do. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I I actually posted that one myself. No, no, I didn't. Thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks, Les, for questions. And we, I tell you what, we'll come back to questions in fifteen minutes or so, I think. Or, or but if you if you're okay with that, because I know people do. 15 20 minutes i know people love the questions do you do you think trauma attracts uh the, the phenomena then and we call it the phenomena it's a collective for it all human emotion 
Yes, yeah, certain ones. There because are... you touched on adolescent <laughs> pains and things earlier. Well, you know, there's a variety of phenomena. It is the same source, I believe, but yeah. there's, there's different different minions like there is in humanity. I mean, we could say we're all humans, but is the army like us, like a person walking down the street? No. You know, you send the army guys in, which are the big boys, and it's the same in the paranormal subjects, or, you know, it's, it's the same. There are different levels. Um, from the highest level, we believe they're referred to as light beings, or they've referenced the name lightertons, and yet I've never found that anywhere. But um, when they turn up, all communications end, period. And when they talk, that's nothing like a DVP. I mean, it's, the whole room vibrates. It's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, it's only two times that's happened, but it ends all communications. And it sounds to me sometimes like when we're having certain communications with some things, it, it, I get this impression of the, it's the naughty kids doing stuff like they shouldn't do, and then the parent walks in and catches them in the act. And it all goes to an end, you know. It's I get that impression sometimes. So, you know. so we, do you think we're dealing with, if we talked about it on a biblical term, angels and demons? Uh, are, are, are aliens the same thing, or is there a separation, or is it just our interpretation depending on your religious beliefs? But you know. yeah, I mean, our interpretations are, 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 you know, what is interpretation? Well, our interpretations is based on somebody else's. Yeah. Well, who was the original? <laughs> the original would have experienced something, and then we put that to mind and go, "Okay, that's an interpretation." And then we envisage that, and and this is why we have so many variations, you know. But uh, I believe demons and devils and gargoyles. Actually, I interviewed somebody who saw a gargoyle sat in his lounge. You know, it's crazy. Um, people will see. I mean, I've seen some stuff, and I think to myself. Yes, no way. No. I'm not having it, you know. And I, and I think to myself, anything goes, Paul. There's no base model to this. And this is what they found in the ufological stuff in 1977 when Jacques Vallée was doing this work and um, and Heineck. This, there's no base model. In 1977, Project Blue Book had listed over 12 million variations, 12 million variations of the UFO. There's no base model for the phenomena. And it's the same for its occupants. No matter if the something walking around a... A, a national forest or if it's the small fae doing the same things or it's uh, some type of half human half, half robot strange creatures um mothmen lizardmen owlmen you know they they forever changing the mask yeah well yeah that's that's where i'm going i suppose with that are we dealing with the same thing then and it's such and the variations are just our take and our our slant on what we want to see is it giving us what we want to see well yeah i think sometimes but i think it likes to follow the trends because this is why we have so many grays which have been seen because now we have the great method of introducing the um that interpretation on a massive scale through internet media and television the gray the gray the gray the gray even got you know, laptops with alienware and they've got greys on them. And they'll quite commonly use what comes to mind first and that will be it. You know, but before all that was happening, before the internet and everything, it was, there was variations even further. In fact, actually, variations only took, you know, uh, were, were fast. We had the after 10 late, about a 10 year lifespan. The greys lasting well and that's because of us. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, because you can't get it, it's the easiest thing that comes to mind. They'll utilize what they've got in us. To produce what they want, and that grey stuff before that, the space brothers, the lizard men, and all sorts of different things over the years. But I think it, you know, I don't think we're going to get out of the grey situation until we start not utilizing that so so much, so it's not in the mindset so much. What about then the the, the cryptid phenomena, and because it seems to be coming more to the forefront, people are a little bit more accepting. Is it because? Is it because of the shift and people are telling these of these accounts and stories that that and we're not actually seeing any seeing or hearing about them anymore? It's just that people are a little bit more accepting of it because it appears to have always been here. When you look back through old texts, the reports of these things. Yeah, 
Because it's tapping the source. I mean, you know, what's the greatest fear that we have in the outdoors and the open ranges and things like that, or at night or in wooded areas? It's, it's predators. It's, there's your natural thing. It's within us. We're worrying that we're stalked. It's an ancient survival thing. You know, it, it happens. You know, we're on alert in places like that when things can hide in corners or round trees and stuff. Phenomena just utilizes what's already in within us. And of course, the decrypted is going to make sure you. You, it's all about the scare you know that yeah. you paul so it's it's all about that because okay. these predators and they don't attack attack they seem to it's all about the fear creating the fear the, the, you know steve and the, 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 once again and i'm not telling you or any of our listeners anything that they don't already know but the similarities are there you talked about the ufos seemingly just manifesting just they're there and they talk about the movements of these animals that sort of these these creatures. Well, I'm reluctant to say animals in true flesh and blood sense because from the reports that we got from Wolflands, these things just glided along the wall. These things, yeah. just, the, the illuminating eyes. There's so many things that detach them from a natural flesh and blood creature. Well, I mean, from my sightings of some things like that, they move beyond normality. Um they, they, they bound across faster than they could, should be able to move. You know, it's not normal. Um, so it doesn't fit normal into the physics of the reality around them, just like UFOs sometimes. But when we started doing studies into the cryptic side in regarding Project Doorway, we realised that, you know, this infrasonic sound is generated, and that's an induction of fear sometimes, because fear is a big issue with this. Um, also that there are those incidences where it's metaphysical in nature. You know, sometimes they're seen and then not seen and heard, um, but they sometimes leave physical marks. Sometimes there's no footprints will just disappear as if, they, where did they go? And just look it up. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know where. The footprints are half a step, half. In fact, half of one, not full step, half a step. You know, it was missing the front of its feet. It's It was gone, no more tracks. You know, so you think to yourself, okay, so... The metaphysical in nature, if that's the case, just like the UFOs and the paranormal stuff. So all these interconnections and stuff. And we find sulfur smells and bad odors yeah. have been often associated with the paranormal, the UFOs, and, of course, the cryptids as well. And even though you can go back, because I, I stretch right across and I've found the US has cryptids. The UK has cryptids. Some parts in Europe have cryptids. Crypt is in India. Now, you know, the Indian temples, right? And I did some research on that purposely because they've got dogmen sculptured onto the side of Indian temples over 2,000 years of age. And not just that, they've also got strange pixie-type creatures on them. And you think to yourself, that's come straight out of a European or island, you know? And it's, yeah, it's there. Um, and you think to yourself, well, okay, well... If we go back to ancient times, Egyptian or Sumerian, Babylonian, that sort of thing, Crimea existed for them. For them, it did. These are half human, half something else. Yeah. Very yeah. different versions of them. But what if, what if the visions of Crimea were real? The visions, which is really no much different than you might experience something strange as you're walking through the forest one day. You know, is it godly? Well, everything was godly then. If you can't understand it, it was a god, and it'd be given a name and so on. And, and it has, and it's it's been given loads of names because it loves its worship, loves its flock, this thing. And this is why I believe initiation experiences might happen when you're seven years of age, when they come knocking on our door on the bedroom, or they, they turn up in our rooms, Paul, because I think somewhere, because they know about phenomena and they know how long you know, into the future things can take place. They know about that. They've demonstrated that. How did you know? Maybe it's the fact that you know you're going to be sat there talking to five thousand people one day, and I am, and I'm spreading their word. We're doing it for them because that's what they like. You're doing it, and I'm doing it, and many others are doing it. But is it why? Is it because of that initiation experience we had when we were young? That's put us where we are. If you think about it, they may have known that, and that initiation spirit is is, is done it for them. Maybe that is just the change and acknowledgement. Maybe. Do, do, do you touching about things that happen when you're younger. Uh, what about imaginary friends then? And I'm not saying every child that's got an imaginary friend, it's some kind of alien stroke, paranormal visitation, but I wonder how much of that 
because they're very real to the uh, the time to the children and the parents never seem to be able to get to grips with who they're talking to in their room because it seems to stop when the door opens and uh, uh, you know you, have you investigated things like that have you spoken yeah, to people some of them i mean only from a power psychology side of things, yeah uh, that children up to the age of seven uh, well up to the six or seven years of age um they their their vision is different you know they it's actually they see slightly a wider scope of 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 the visual range than an adult would do so there is the possibility that they are there is phenomena fringing upon them that they are experiencing because what they tend to do this phenomenon is they don't want to be detected by the adults so they step in just to the area where the child sees but it doesn't last for long because the child grows it and changes its visions. You know, it actually comes to collapse as uh, using the you know the the, the cone and rods in our eyes all alter. So maybe it's it's, it's it, you know the masters of manipulation. They know how to target a child and interact with one because they love that sort of stuff without being detected by the adult because I am just on the fringe of your child's eyesight and interaction. And that's where the most they, they can be they can be really manipulated sometimes children um but usually it's short-lived and as we get older it, it actually reduces thank you and I, I think just before we went to questions you were just you were going to speak about apports and you're going to tell us you have yeah. done before but be as detailed as you want you know just yeah, well, we were doing, of course with the airport phenomenon we realized when we started to relocate the airports on people's homes well, that first of all there. explain what they are first steve yeah well i mean of course yeah i mean here's a typical example i mean we're not talking about objects that don't belong i mean we found some of them in the past some of them are cracking brilliant ones there was a bra <laughs> it was a bra stretched across the bedpost of a double bed and it had to be cut off. It couldn't even stretch it enough to put it on, let alone get it off. Thing is, though, it didn't belong to the person in the house. She blamed her husband that, oh, you're, you've seen somebody and stuff. Caused a massive rupture. Of course, this is what the phenomenon likes. Vexation, stress, all that. So it manifested this thing, these things in homes sometimes that don't even belong on purpose to get the... Uh, they're not they're very resourceful. They like a reaction. But on many occasions, you get airports and, uh, you know, you put your mug down, you're having a cup of tea, you put your milk in it, you pick up uh, the sugar or something, you look back, it's gone. It's like, where's my mug gone? And you're looking around, you think, am I going mad here? I had my mug was right here. Nobody else is here, it's only me here. And you start to think to yourself, oh, am I going bloody potty or something? I'm in a breakdown. And then you're looking for the mug, because you know it's got a, it's a certain mug, it's got a picture, it's got an S or T on it, or whatever, it's got an image on it. Where is the mug? Well, it must have been here then. It must have disappeared. Turns up about 95 minutes later in the, in the middle of the lounge carpet. You know, they, 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 don't, they do it on purpose so that you recognise them. It's not going to put it on the side over there because you might think, oh, I, might, I must have put it over there. They're clever. They're resourceful. They're not, no, no I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make sure that you damn well know it's paranormal because it gets the rise out of it from you, you say. And that's what they want. They're very resourceful. And that's an apple. And... What we noticed when we took airports away from homes which are having disturbance, especially poltergeist infestations at high frequency, high severity cases, that you get a sudden suppression. Because you talk to the people and say, well, how often do you have an experience? Well, it's high severity, high severity, high frequency. It's like you're getting several actions per day. And that's when it starts to really sort of, it's what you call the RMS value. It's a peak value. So, you know, it's where it peaks off. Um, and that's usually when it's most active and you think, okay. And then you take that mug or the apple, whatever it is, away. It's like two, three days of silence. And they're like, oh, my God, you've done it. You've done it. You've done nothing. So, oh, no, this is early. I don't prove it. will be back. And that's exactly what it does because on many occasions, the phenomena followed the apple. And there were disturbances in the locations the apple was taken to. While the suppression was taking place in the homes of where the airport manifested. But then it only takes 24, 48 hours. And it, it's back. <laughs> it kind of realizes, hey. So we, we thought to ourselves, that we've, you know, maybe they're acting as some type of quantum anchor. In other words, um, it isn't really the mug left. It looks like it, feels like it, weighs the same, it ain't the same. 
But I'm going to leave it in your environment because I know where to deliver phenomena to. But then we come along and go, oh, we're going to move that and put it over there. And the phenomena goes that way. <laughs> you know, for but a short period of time, it kind of realises what's going on. In in some instances, though, Steve, I should think in a lot of instances, if this is happening, people won't even be what you're talking about. And I'm not saying you're wrong, but they won't even be aware that this is happening. They might even just think they're forgetful. Exactly. And in which what, case, then what is the point? What if they're not even there? Yeah. Because I think the phenomena is present in a home isn't just present in a home. It's present in many. It's multitaskful. Yeah, and and I'm and I've just said what is the point as though I, uh, and I've I feel it's it's amazing. Amazing. because it's we're not we might not even be important in what it's doing and what its intentions it's, are. Imagine having imagine you you interacting with twenty households or thirty or forty or maybe more. It, 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 it's management. It, it's like well, okay, I'll, I'll let me put that there because I know that that's going there. Let me do and, and I think it's, it's a management process. Of how to deliver the phenomena to certain key locations and gather, gather it from that, gather it from them. Whatever that phenomenon is doing, it's collective of resource material from varied Thank phenomena. You. you know, you, you've covered so much, Steve. And just before we go to questions in say four or five minutes, uh, if if you want to, you might not even be able to condense it into that. But for those people that don't know, and I've not got lots of knowledge of it, what was the Philip experiment? Oh, sure, yeah. Well, the Philip experiment was um, about the manifestation. It's about tulpas, because we can go back thousands upon thousands of years, and witchcraft is involved in it as well, in regarding the manifestation of a tulpa. And that is that if you believe strongly in something, you can bring it into realism, into the real world. Power and the power of them, exactly the same thing again, mate. Yeah. Um, and it is, it's, it's, it's a collective uh, condition where a collective, a, a number of people are involved in bringing this forward. And that, that's what they did in Ontario um, during the 70s on the Philip experiment, which was a psychology team uh, of specialists and professors, and they got together and they manifested a ghost and it came into realism through the power of belief and it was a process and an experiment to see if it can if it can work things can be born into our reality through thought thought process um and it, we can react and you know we can change sometimes reality and the, the aspects of what's going to take place through thought as well but don't get me wrong, it's easy to go that backwards as well as forwards sometimes because life is hard sometimes. And when it is, it's hard to feel a victim. And when you feel a victim, you feel that you're in the corner and you've been beaten up and I don't deserve, I'm not going to get anywhere and this is that and the other. And if you think that, that's what you'll get delivered. It's almost uh, like the, the negative energy manipulate not manipulates attracts and gathers and gives you more of it you have a run of bad luck kind of thing yeah i mean the the, the whole process of interacting with the phenomena because this is probably a, a quite an important piece of interest to mention there are two processes there is the long and safe method or is the short and dangerous now the short and dangerous is esoteric invocation it's babylonian it's you know it's um the invocation process which we do know is not a good thing to do, but it gets results and it gets results quick, but it's not always great. The safe method is to, is to do it through the normal process of the steps to get to there. It's more of a controlled state. You can shut down, you can, you know, but some people have just blasted right through sometimes. And yeah, they get some really wacky stuff, but it's usually not, um, desirable to do so it's shown upon um but the thing is you know people have done that and um, for thousands and thousands of years been interacting with the phenomena they are better there are different methods of doing it you know the native americans did it through fasting and um you know certain inhalation of drugs and different things it's done in various different countries in different ways but it's all the same place it takes you, you to know, the same yeah. place yeah yeah it's all the same place yeah Oh, fabulous. And I think we're going to go to this place now with uh, Les and some questions again, if that's okay, Steve. We've got about 15 minutes left. Is that okay, Les? Yeah, no problem. And, and um, 
it will get plenty of questions in steve every week and uh, the fantastic uh, uh, people in the stream they're very knowledgeable and uh, they're up there with all the info uh but before i do that i want to just give some name shout outs for monetary donations to the channel tonight paul uh yeah. that's ta is uh, saying lovely lovely so i think she's talking about me or what have you and martin abbas uh thank you martin enigma uh thank you all very welcome and uh great to have that support so i'll put this first question of this session on the screen from alex thompson steve in your experience is the poltergeist phenomena ever truly relevant uh yeah it is yeah in some cases and belabouring in others um i i know of a family that had uh, poltergeist disturbances for 14 years that wasn't a short-lived phenomenon of course spr like to write these rules out oh it's only a very short-lived phenomenon not always 14 years they had those disturbances. in fact they lived with it it was very oh it was quite handy sometimes it did things for them you know and it was a duel did a couple in like in the late 70s the pair of them they're probably not alive now bless them but it was a lovely little house they had and uh and they just lived with it you know they gave it a name you know they lived with it and it was just no in other occasions yeah i mean the rochdale poltergeist case i got thumped in the back and knocked across the room that was a that, that was the that was when i was going to quit this subject because i would add enough you know i did the only thing a professionally <laughs> did and i ran out the door and i ran outside <laughs> it scared me to death you know but um yeah you can be either either you know yeah like i said there's no baseline model for it so the, this house where this old couple live then uh steve is is that is this uh poltergeist activity they still still there in the house or well, when i investigated it but you're talking when was i there I was there about 19 years ago, so they might not even be alive now, but uh, it was it was in a small town called Ashton-upon-Mersey in Sale, Cheshire, in the UK. And uh, lovely, lovely people, both in the late 70s, husband and wife, lived there for quite some time. They'd had these things for years. And it was it was definitely a poltergeist infestation, but was quite happy to be there. So you think to yourself, well, who's it drawing upon? Why was it there? See, there's, there is no rule book like that. You know, a lot of these establishments like to say there are, but... That's only because they've probably not come across things that aren't that don't fit the rule book. And when they do, they kind of say, let's not change the rule book, let's just push it aside. And you can't do that. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Alex. Uh, Blue Shift uh, question for Steve. Are the reports mimics like the mug? Well, I can only say the mug was. Absolutely. Well, the mug was definitely when you when you scan it against the normal, a normal test mug because it came off the same production line at the same time all four of them so and you you analyze that first and you put that into the system and, you, and it read, gives all the details and the readouts and the numbers and stuff and then you do the on the airport and it, the, the computer goes it's not even the same thing it's not even it might look like it and weigh it this way 3.9 grams or same, and it, and, it, and it feels the same it looks the same but it's not it's not so it was so different we have to suggest could it question mark could it be a mimic and if that's the case, where's the original one? Where's this one come through? Or is it an old is it is it something that's been altered so much that it can't even recognize it was, was the original one that's altered so much? There is a possibility of either either. But what we can say is that it's very difficult. We see time dissolved dilation in some airports, newspapers, the skull ones, and other things that have happened over the years in different places, things that you can recognize a time differential on. The newspaper the Apple from yeah. Skull aged 500 days per day in a glass container kept out of UV light up till they looked like they should have done from 1936 to 1998 in a very short period of a month. It just shows how fast it happened. It sort of caught up in time. Um, you know, so, but if you've got a coin or a mug, I mean, I can put a mug or a coin on the shelf for 100 years and take it down, you'd not notice any difference. You see, so it's hard to work out sometimes. That mo most items which are apported are things that you cannot see time dilation in. Isn't that interesting? It, it is uh, maybe not the same, but is there some similarities to when the the guy at Skinwalker shot the wolf? He said, and a, a lump of flesh flew off it. And it deteriorated and sort of broke down and went to yeah. like nothing within yeah. a very short space of time. That's it. Time dilation. 
because it's biologics. This is it. I mean, very rare. You do get them, but very, very rarely will they produce something that gives you a time dilation evidence. Um, most of them, it's always picked on things which we won't find the time dilation in them. It's a good example of why we, we can never get anything physical as proof of, of yeah. what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll put the next question from OGG. Steve, have you ever witnessed levitation? Mm, I have witnessed um, only in the uh, experiments, the psychological experiments, that items have moved and lifted and turned and stuff like that. Yeah. I've seen it like not levitation of anybody. I've never seen levitation of somebody or anything like that. But certainly small items and things through experiments, yeah. Okay, this question from Lauren Angle. Angel. Steve, are the UFOs part of the phenomena or the cause of the phenomena? Part of. That is a part of as well. Part of because it's you know, it's it's forever changing. You know, and sometimes what is very clever do, do, does the UFO phenomena is that it 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 it, it, um, it slightly predates the existence of something it could be. You know, I mean, the, the Foo Fighters, which looks like uh, fire, tracer fire and stuff like that, that's why they're called firefighters, the Foo Fighters, um, was just prior to the Second World War. And it fits, fight, like in, it's like fixing, it's like creating the glove for the hand, it's gone its way, you know. Um, <laughs> same for the ghost rockets. You know, from the yeah. 19, 1940s. Um, you know, that's that fitted in perfectly. The Phantom airships. Phantom airships. Phantom airships prior to the Phantom airship. You know, it's, it's, they're good at what they do. I say that. But they know, they must know what's coming. They must do. There's a book there somewhere, Steve. <laughs> On all these predated ones. Yeah, listen. <laughs> okay, I've got a question from, because I am conscious of the time, Paul. Uh, yeah, nickname, yeah. If, you get the if you get the time, uh, can you cover the tunnels under Manchester? Thank you. Yeah, well, the Guardian Tunnels, my father worked there. That's how I got to find them. And we've, we had two very unusual things. My father signed two official secrets acts. I signed two official secrets acts. I went to work for NATO um, on certain telecommunications. And my father went to work in telecommunications at uh, the Guardian Tunnels. And I don't know why, but maybe I got the, I got the, the help in hand to that role because of my father's role or something. I don't know. Um, but they're deep underground Manchester and they stretch for quite far. Mm. And there's specialized um, cables under there which go off to the, the, you know, the prime minister and parliament and military bases and stuff like that in case of communications and what. Um, and they're highly guarded, highly. And these blast tunnels, they're called blast tunnels because they've got these doors on them which are like a huge vault door which are about two foot thick. And it's in case of nuclear war, it survives the communications throughout the country, which is very important to have during a war. Um, the biggest problem they had was rats. But in the 1986, they installed equipment, which like little lasers, which shot the rats in the middle of the night. That's why it was a no-go zone. And then he used to come down in the morning and clear all the old carcasses out. And that was 86. What type of, what type of technology were you using there in 1986? Something that's straight out of space 1999. <laughs> you, you, you would think something impregnable they wouldn't have a problem with rats we're told for you get in because you have to have ventilation systems and air yeah. and stuff the people working down there and uh, and when they're bringing in these things they, they squeeze through the tiniest gaps yeah. they love to chew oh they love chew through concrete can't they rats seriously oh, no it's, it's a nightmare and they just you know I mean can you imagine chewing the prime minister's line one day hello hello you know <laughs> <laughs> Right, I've got a question from Ben22. I don't know how much time you can devote to this, uh, Steve, but if, if everything is linked like UFOs, poltergeist, where do you think ghosts come into it, like the classic Grey Lady? Okay, so when it comes to the paranormal, we've got various different types. I mean, the word like hauntings is broken down to several categories because you've got residual <laughs> phenomena, which is recorded events played back. It's not really a haunting, I would say. More uh, probably a uh, more of a natural phenomena. It's it's brought on by heightened emotion captured and played back. Not just negative, sometimes positive as well. Um, but the connections in regarding all aspects in the power known. If you brought if you brought up a, a sheet, a tick sheet like we've got on our computer systems, you know we found over eight hundred 
connections between the two, and that cannot be by chance. You know, and, and it's not just, that's current 800. I mean, if we go back in time, there's actually more because the, the 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 wall between the subjects got thinner and thinner over the year in, in times of past and got more and more determined as a separate subject in the future, especially over the last 70 years because the ruse is, is like they're extraterrestrial. They're traveling from vast distances of other planets. And now what's happening? Well, the good thing for us that's why our work and probably Paul's work and maybe other people's work has been illuminated so much now is because we're already in there. Now, what's happening is they've decided, okay, guys, it's time for the narrative change. We can't go by this anymore. It won't work. They're not ETs. The NHIs, non-human intelligences. We were doing that years ago. You know, we knew that change was going to happen. Just didn't think it was going to be within the eight years. Interdimensionals. It's actually mentioned in the Pentagon now. Interdimensional beings and stuff. So, we're talking about other realities and other things around us. That's the new narrative. Now people are going, oh, I'm interested in this new narrative. And they go to that location. They find, oh, hang on a second. It's already occupied by Paul, Barry, myself, and a few others. And that's why it gets illuminated now. Because we are already there in the public domain. They were there before us. But in the public domain, we were there for the in the public yeah. domain. And, of course, people are getting interested in this now. They're starting to say, well, where are they coming from then? What does all this mean? Where does the connections between the paranormal and UFO lie? Um, well, it, it's all encompasses, and like I say, just to finish off on that CRS system, which was the, the best AI system ever generated. Jack Vallée tried it in the 1960s. Computers weren't brilliant then. It didn't really work too well, but modern ones, three years of filling up everything in this computer pertaining to the subject, sub-subjects, sub-subjects. I mean, that's everything you can think of. Your cryptids, your earth mysteries, your, your UFO, your paranormal, your supernatural, your spiritual, everything went into that computer in hope of it determining what is this, what's going on, what does it all mean? You press the button, expecting reams of information to come out, but it's not, it's like one page. After all that, it's like, it sounds a bit disappointing. But what was interesting was the two references were very interesting. The first one, it shows so much connectivity between all, not one was left out, all phenomena that the AI thought it's a source. What is the source? Now, if it's one thing, what is it? Is it God? Is, God that, is it? What is it? I don't know, but it's godly powered. So it's, you know, it's one source. And the second thing it said was interesting is that it has the capabilities of creating physiological constructs. I'm a physical construct. This is the chair, the table, when it chooses to be. And that's basically saying, well, we're dealing with metaphysical phenomena across the whole board. And that's a seemingly, that's exactly what it seems that we get. So and it came on, we thought, okay, that's really interesting coming from modern day AI um, that is seeing that and it's coming up with those conclusions. Um, and when you start to sort of pry into those areas, you start to kind of work out, well, yeah, you think about it, you know, they, they are very, very similar in different, in different ways. Great answer. Thank you. And just before you get to the question, and we're not going to dwell on the subject of rats, but I did see blue ships. Uh, they have to chew. is spot on. We know that the teeth never stop growing, do they? So uh, yeah. They get massive teeth. Yeah. <clears throat> so, right, let's go on. We've got enough time. Have we one more? Yeah, we've got a minute. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. He, so, uh, are you okay with sharing accounts from New Mexico? I would be. I'm sure Steve would be. Yeah, sure, yeah. I don't have any problem. Uh, just before yeah, we get to a question, where can people contact have you, email address? Put it out there, Steve, or so that anybody in chat who wants to con contact you like he's up. Yes, it's an S underscore Merrim, my second name, M-E-R-A, at yahoo.com. I mean, most people just sort of Google Steve Merrim. They'll find some details there. I've always put my details out. I like to talk to people about my experiences. Brilliant. <clears throat> but anything in particular about New Mexico, well, he's probably not going to have time to get back to you with that. Right. I don't. I know. Some information and fire it at me as well. I'll pass it on to Steve if because I'm interested. But okay, yeah. let's go. Might just squeeze Pendle little UFOs question. Do you think sharing a UFO event with somebody then they have their own UFO events is connected? Uh, and if so, is there a reason, please? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, because the phenomena can pass from one individual to another. It's like. It's a contagion, it's like a virus. Contagion, yeah. it can happen. Um, some people have some form of immunity, and those are usually scientists. 
Mm. They've already made the mind okay, up for and these people think... that, this, that it doesn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. I'm afraid I would do have really any time to get any more questions in. Uh, or I'll, probably just get, I'll just probably just get this one. It's a quick answer on this one. Have you ever visited 30 East Drow? Yes. Yeah. I did. Uh, Twice. Um, just a normal one of the mill house for me. Nothing. Didn't experience anything. Didn't notice anything. Didn't register anything. But, you know, that's <laughs> just one. No, okay. As, on that note, then, I've got to uh, apologise for not getting through all the questions. Uh, sorry, Martin. Uh, Martin Avis, you asked a couple there. Uh, Mike, the disabled Welshman, didn't get yours through a point of light. Sorry about that. Brett Barrow, artist, Mark Jones and OGG and Tino. Sorry about that, guys. And uh, But we tried. We've run out of time. And uh, I've got to thank, I've got to thank Paul. And I've got to thank uh, Steve Mira for coming up. Yes, same goes for me. Thank you, Les. Honor thank and you. privilege as always. You're very welcome, Dennis. Uh, seriously, absolutely made it so easy for us. Steve, thank you. We'd love to have you back. Thank you. No problem, buddy. Keep in touch. I'll talk soon. Will and, do. Uh, on that note, folks, we will sign out and then we'll see you probably on Sunday. Is that right, Paul? That's right. Yeah, we'll be there Sunday. We'll be there. Right. See you guys. <laughs>